morning, I am John Lajide, the founder and CEO of Access and the 2020 um, Dallas Regional Chamber Board Chair. On behalf of everyone at the DRC, I want to welcome you to today's Board of Advisors conversation featuring Ray Washburn. Um, and today's presentation is by JLL, an organization that needs no introduction. They are a world leader in real estate services. And also thank you to our platinum sponsors, plus platinum sponsor, McCarthy. When I became chair in January, I um, never imagined um, that within a few months that our community will be impacted by something like um, COVID-19, something that certainly um, I had never heard of, totally unprecedented. And um, how we do our work a couple of months ago is totally different from how we do our work now. And in fact, how we do it from two weeks ago, a few weeks ago has totally changed. And I'm sure that how we do our work um, going into the future will evolve as well. During this last few months, I've had the opportunity to see the DRC um, up close. And I know that the DRC has transformed the way, it's, the way it works um, while always um, keeping at the forefront what our mission is to um, keep our Dallas region the best place to live, work and do business. And um, through a, a robust communication strategy um, that includes a job board for displaced workers, a responsible return to work series and more programming, including this board of advisors um, series today, our commitment at the DRC to our mission remains strong and it's paying off. Um, uh, we, we've never been more connected, it would, although it's a virtual world, we've never been more connected to our members than we, than we are today. And, um, and, and that connection is um, very strong. Um, our Board of Advisors program was created to bring decision makers and um, top executives together to network, to connect, and really discuss the key issues affecting our business community. And it's our hope that the, the programming continues to accomplish these goals for you um, in your role as a regional leader um, and that you can continue to find a lot of value in it. It's certainly been very, very um, insightful and helpful for me. Um, over the past three weeks, we've heard from James, I mean, just remarkable business leaders in our community, James Hoffines, we've heard from Brent Ryan, and um, just last week, we heard from Mark Cuban as well. These are three top uh, business leaders from our region who are representing us on the state level and the national level as well. And today we're honored um, to have someone that I, I respect a lot and um, I'm glad to finally meet, um, Ray Washburn. Um, we're glad to have him provide his insights today. Um, I cannot wait to hear from Ray about his work as a successful um, entrepreneur and um, even more importantly, a public servant. Can't wait to hear from him today. Ray will talk with um, David Schechter, um, a reporter at WFAA for about 15 to 20 minutes. And then our platinum sponsor, McCarthy, will provide some brief remarks before the question and answer session. And just so you all know, you can use the, the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions and we, we plan to make sure we wrap up before noon and um, get you back to your um, work today. Today's conversation is proudly presented by JLL. I mentioned earlier, they need no introduction at all. They're a global leader in their industry for sure. And their mission is to, to buy, build, occupy, and invest in um, a variety of real estate assets globally. And just last week, um, JLL, um, rose 10 spots um, to number 179 on the Fortune 500 um, list. And I just want to say congratulations to them. Um, GLL has certainly been a, a role model in their sector, especially during this COVID-19 crisis. And they've been a true leader um, for our community overall and their industry, as I mentioned, providing resources, um, um, guidebooks, uh, and just different helpful tools um, for all uh, businesses to, to really think about how to get through the COVID-19 crisis and as we all think about returning to work. So I just wanna say thank you to GLL for their leadership. I know that GLL is a longtime friend of Ray, both uh, professionally and personally. 
and they're happy to present this conversation and really thank Ray for all he um, continues to do for Dallas and our region. Um, so I just wanna say again, thank you JLL for, for this. Um, now it's my honor to share a little bit more with all of you about Ray. Um, he's, um, he's the president and CEO of Charter Holdings. He's also the co-owner of the N Crowd Restaurant Group. Um, they own several restaurants that many of you know already, including Nicosina and the Katy Trail um, Ice House Chains. Ray is also the former president and CEO of the Overseas um, Private Investment Corporation, and he's also a member of the President's Economic um, Revival Industry Groups. Ray is certainly and uh, truly a Renaissance man with a deep understanding of so many things, including the hospitality, retail, um, finance, um, foreign relations, and political sectors, among lots of other things. Ray and his wife, Heather, are active in the Dallas community and very, very proud and generous, generous supporters of SMU. Interviewing Ray today will be David Shakhtar, a reporter at WFAA and the host, co-producer and co-creator of Verify Road Trip. David has been awarded multiple times by his peers in the industry and um, Dale, I, I know you'll like this thing. Just so you know, um, while David is not a, a graduate of, of Michigan State, he's a, he's a proud Michigan Wolverine. And I know Dale likes that a lot. So without further ado, I wanna welcome Ray and David to today's um, meeting and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, John and Ray. It's great to be here with you. I'm looking forward to uh... A great conversation. I, I just wanted to start off by saying I was at Highland Park Village last night. Uh, my wife and I were sitting out in front of Royal Blue and talking about simple pleasures. And she said, well, if I could just have a glass of wine here two nights a week, um, life would just be so much nicer. And the idea of simple pleasures has really taken forefront a lot of people's lives. I'm just wondering, as we kind of get started, have you found a couple of things during this time that bring you simple pleasures? Well, I'd like to get your wife to have weekly, uh, more seven nights a week. Just, you know, just <laughs> We're working on it. But yeah, no, it's, it's uh, you know, interesting times for all of us and from all our companies. And we had to furlough a couple thousand people in March and we've been able to bring most of them back on. So it's been an interesting time because most of my businesses are focused in Dallas and from construction projects to, you know, owning apartments and retail centers and so we've had to deal with it all, but you know, the pleasures are in, in at least fortunately in our family and our, our companies, everyone's safe and healthy and we're just trying to get back to normalcy like everybody. Yes, absolutely. So the, he the headlines of this week have been particularly mm -hmm. giving a lot of context to what's going on. hundred thousand deaths in the United States today. We heard 40 million people have filed unemployment claims. Um, I want to get a sense of the economic impact on your business. Governor Abbott said that restaurants could initially open at 25% and that you, you had said that that didn't make sense. You weren't going to do that, but you did do that. We're at 50% now and can you have 46 restaurants. Can they make money at 50%? And if they can't, then why are they open? Well, the interesting thing in, that has come out of all this for us we, our restaurants normally do about 10% of takeout. So your kitchens are designed for that, um, your packaging and all those things. What we found is we shot up to 50% of our normal sales is takeout, but you lose money on it because of the packaging and, and the staffing. And you know, you're not running a 50% kitchen or a 25% kitchen, you're running a 100% kitchen. And when the governor originally came out and said, we're gonna go to 25%, you know, we were barely able, we all the excess money we were making, we were hiring back as many people as we could. And so that was fine when we were just doing takeout. We went to 25%. That, by description, you're now actually losing money. And so right. all the restaurant companies I talked to, no one was going to open up. And then all of a sudden, everyone did an about face. And if our competitors opened up, we had to open up. I couldn't lose my business to someone down the street. A lot of restaurants are never going to open again. I mean, this week, Dakota's downtown Dallas of Legendary Dallas restaurant is announced they're not opening up. Their whole chains like Old Chicago and and uh, Brio and ones like that are just, they're going into liquidation right now. And so 
we did all we could to hang on. Now we've gone to 50%. The issue in the restaurants, for those of you that have gone out, is when you go into a restaurant that's only 25% full or 50% full, and as you know, Mi Casina, you know, is a pretty vibrant, high energy type restaurant. If you walk, it feels like a tomb otherwise. It and does, yeah. Want to eat in there. And so they've got, in my mind, you make a decision when you're walking to the bathroom, you're walking by every table. You're not walking by every other table or every quarter table. And so when I talk to all my other restaurant, you know, restaurant tours in the city, our frustration is just not getting clear definition. Now, Katie Charles Ice House, the majority of our seating there is outside, and that's a six foot diff, um, um, distancing. And so that's 100% weather driven. Katie Charles Ice House, if it's beautiful outside, we got a great crowd. If it's raining, it's not. But the big difference I think you're going to see out of this is all, over capacity of restaurants aren't going to open. A lot of them have been, have been over leveraged to begin with, aren't going to reopen. And then we're going to be, we usually open three or four new restaurants a year. There's going to be a huge hesitancy to right. sign new leases if you don't know what's going to happen six months from now. Have you been in touch at all with the governor's office about plans for, to go to 75%? It seems like we've done a lot of stories about schools, for example. And, you know, if with six foot social distancing, a classroom of 25 can only hold 12 people. The same would be true for a restaurant in terms of keeping that six foot distance. Can you, can you get over 50%? Are you getting any guidance on that at all? Not, not right now. We don't know when it, when it will go to 75%. So, you know, what, what, the city of Dallas has done, which I applaud them for, is they allow us now to put seats. If you were in the village last night, you saw we just stick tables and chairs in the parking lot now. Right. It's actually kind of created a festive environment. As long as we have cool weather, it's fine. But you're seeing it all over Dallas. And we're trying to make up capacity from area where we didn't have capacity before. It's going to be the summer of late nights and patios, I think, is what it's going to be. Wait till the sun goes down. I'll meet you on the patio, right? That's right. That's right. Uh, so you were named to the uh, President, Trump, Trump, President Trump's Great American Economic Revival Industry Group for Food and Beverage. That was announced with quite a bit of fanfare for this Blue Ribbon Panels. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was 45 days ago. I did a Google search for any, there's no news has come out of that in 45 days. So maybe you can make a little bit. Do you have a sense of what a national plan would look like to save restaurants and bars and places where we gather? Well, there's a lot of discussion of things like business interruption insurance. How do we force majeure in our leases and things like that? But I'm on both sides of the equation. I own shopping centers and I have restaurants. So hmm. I see both sides of the discussion. And the, the leave out on this is the insurance companies and the banks that hold the mortgages on centers. And a lot of the discussion is how can the government get involved somehow with the business interruption insurance side and, and the litigation is going to get involved. I mean, the plaintiff bar is all over this. They're trying to figure out how, but if there's a hurricane, I'll give you an example. If there's a hurricane in New Orleans and you own a restaurant and you don't get damaged by water, flooding, by winds or anything like that, you can still file and get business interruption insurance, even though your restaurant wasn't damaged, but it's part of a national disaster zone. Well, the president has claimed the whole United States is a disaster zone, as well as the governor in our state. So the discussions are really about the health and safety of our employees, the health and safety of our of our customers, and then how do we deal with this from a legal standpoint on with, with, with the insurance we've all paid for for years, and now it's time to collect. And if we don't get it, this PPP for so many people has kind of paid the rent for March, April, May. The, the truth is all going to come in July and August if we're still at 50% and PPP is not extended or new money isn't input it into the program, that's when the big fall is going to begin. So is this is this revival group, is it meeting? And and are you getting we, feedback we from the from the White House? Yeah, we physically don't meet, but we have, you know, calls like this and yeah, you know, side groups, side working groups and discussions and and uh, you know from our perspective, the president was in the hotel business and the restaurant business and he understands the plight of of our business. Do I have an answer for it? No. I mean, it's, it's, uh, but also as a landlord, I want to collect rents for my tenants because what you're finding with landlords and most shopping centers, especially if you're in the CNBS market and kind of a, which is commercial mortgage backed securities, they're not given any leeway. And so it's like, when does this hit? And I, I think if you look at this as a J curve 
recovery. I, I don't think it's, everyone thinks the stock market's coming back, but we got to figure out when people start paying rents again, when we start getting business back in our restaurants again, and we're not going to know that to this fall. So I wanted to ask you about also another sort of national issue. Uh, Governor of North Carolina, uh, uh, Roy Cooper, and, and the president have been in a bit of an argument. The president wants to have no social distancing at right. the RNC uh, this summer. And, and if the governor can't promise that, which it sounds like maybe he, he won't, then he's the president's threatening to pull that convention. So as, based on you know your work with then Mayor Rawlings uh, on a late bid to get to the GOP to come to Dallas in 2016, are you involved in any specific plans to steal that convention and bring it to Dallas? Well, I, I, I'm not part, I chaired the last convention, but this one I'm not, I have no part of. But I, all I'll say is it takes a, a, a local raise of about 25 to $50 million. They've raised that in Charlotte or a good majority of it. That money would have to be given back to the local banks and corporations and we'd have to go raise it again here. And I just don't practically see that happening in the next 60 days to go raise that kind of money in, in, in this economy. I mean, you're not going to see the big corporations stroking the checks for it. So, so you're but saying I'm that, not, that's an impediment for anyone to to steal the convention or you're not going to get 25 to $50 million raised in that amount of time in this, yeah. in this economy. Yeah, on, on that. So I don't know. I, I don't, again, I'm not part of those discussions. I just know the practical aspect because I've done it. Uh, I know you've also, you, earlier this year, you donated $5 million to SMU for the uh, soccer and, and track stadium there. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any insight on how SMU is doing um, and what they're thinking about as they look forward to the next school year? Well, I have a child there now and I have an incoming freshman. So yes, we're very involved in the, uh, in the school and school starts. I mean, my, my, both my boys are in online summer school now and then summer school is going to be physically back in at this, you know, second half of the summer. And so, um, and one of my boys plays on the football team. And so the football practice is getting kind of started up. So all the communication we're hearing from the school is it's going to be business as usual this fall. So are you concerned about the impact at all on, uh, on uh, higher education from the coronavirus and the pandemic? I just, it's not my uh, field of expertise. Okay. I talked to you about a lot of things, but that's one I... I Fair enough. Fair enough. So um, looking at the, uh, looking forward at the 2020 election, you do have a, a wealth of political involvement uh, mm -hmm. and knowledge. How do you think the election plays out? What do you think the involvement or the interplay between the pandemic and responses will be in the election process? Is, it, is that going to be the only issue? There's certainly a lot of time still between, between now and November. Well, there's an old adage in, in, in the political business, you know, polls and rhetoric don't matter till after Labor Day. And so, and if you look back in history, there are going to be a lot of things that are going to happen between now and Labor Day that just really aren't going to matter. And it's after both conventions are over. And so it'd be better have this conversation, you know, the Monday after or the Tuesday after Memorial Labor Day, that last sprint will determine things. So all the talk and conversation polls, I don't look at any of them now because this doesn't matter at this point. You don't know who Biden's going to pick as a VP. Okay. You, know, you don't know how this pandemic, if, if things really open up and business gets going again in July and August, which we're hoping it does. And, you know, is there a threat of it coming back? So it's a parlor game right now to guess. And so I just don't guess. I just wait till later. <laughs> What, I mean, what about the, the overall effect of, of politics is challenging, though, and you can't really go out and campaign? Um, well, true. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, uh, that's why these conventions are going to be interesting to see, you know, how, how they're held. But it's, you know, the, the old way of doing it really changed when Trump came in and, you know, no longer having uh, press conferences and things like that. So everything we've done in our past, you kind of throw away and it's just a new world now. But Again, I get back to the Labor Day deal. If you look at polling, just go all the way back in history until you hit Labor Day, you, things just change. Because you got to get through both conventions and see how that goes. Absolutely. So I'm sitting at WFA right now uh, on Young Street looking at your building across the, the way here, the Dallas Morning News uh, mm -hmm. former building, which is uh, is I, there's a lot of work going on there, I can tell you, because I've, I've, been, I've been watching it happen. Tell us about that, uh, that development. It's very exciting for this end of town um, yeah. to really have a resurgence in that space. What's going on over there? 
Well, I bought, it was about eight acres of land. I bought it about a year ago. The Morning News had owned it since the 1940s. And I knew it was a cool building. I've owned a lot of properties in town. I, I really bought it and then started to think about what I was going to do with it because it's about a 450,000 foot main building, about a 500 car parking garage and TXCN's old 80,000 foot broadcast studios. And so since it's attached to the convention center underneath, the Dallas Convention Center has never had an entertainment district. And if you go to any other city in the, in the country, whether it's Houston, Nashville, LA Live, and Los Angeles, we need something for our visitors to do when they come to town. And that's what I'm in. I'm in the entertainment business, really, with my restaurants and Palm Park Village and different things. So what I'm going to create is the entertainment district for, for the convention center and knock down the buildings in the back have it flow up Record Street between Channel 8 and, and my building. And in the front, I'm gonna have a 130 room boutique hotel that's in the old George Dahl historical building. That building was built in the 40s, was built to add seven floors on top. That's why there's such mm -hmm. massive uh, uh, columns. So I'm gonna do 250 apartments on top of it, on top of the George Dahl building. And then what used to be the old press room, we're going to turn into something like the bomb factory. It's going to be a 2,000, 2,500 seat concert facility. And then behind it, where the TXCN was and those things, that's going to get torn down. And our plan is to build an 1,100 room, 40 story convention hotel. And, you know, our design work was really cranking on that until February. The back hotel's on hold for now. The front hotel is, I mean, we're cranking away on it, hopefully open in 24 months when, when we're on the other side of this. And so when it's finished, you'll be able to go to a convention, walk out, walk down Record Street. We'll have 12 to 15 bars and restaurants and entertainment. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Two hotels. And then people at the sixth floor and down in Dealey Plaza right now, which is our biggest tourist attraction city, you go down there any day and it's just packed of tourists. And most of them are, have maps out and they're looking around like, what do we do next? There's nowhere to go after I've been to the yeah. sixth floor. What am I supposed to do? And so we're a block and a half away. And so the idea is hopefully pull them down through also the people at the Hyatt Regency and the other hotels and pull it all the way through to the convention center and make that the major uh, entertainment corridor down there. A lot of density you're talking about. Ha any, any reservations about or thoughts about this is not the time to keep going forward on this or the plans never, you never really wavered on that? No, I'm, I'm, I play offense. So I'm, I'm, I'm full of full forward. It's going to open, you know, originally we were going to try to open in the fall of 22. Now it looks like it'll be the spring or summer of 23. And if that's the case, uh, that's where the front hotel, the big one in back, we're just going to have to wait and determine on that probably first quarter of next year, but the whole front part and the bars and restaurants, you know, that, that'll open in 23. And as you've seen, we've got multiple trucks a day going in there. One interesting thing to your listeners that might, we're outbidding different parts of the project. We've already seen construction pricing come down 12, 10 to 12%. Really? For a project that'll start next year. I think a lot of contractors, you know, a lot of cranes in the air today and Dallas is a boom town, but I think everyone's looking out and going, okay, who's going to be either smart enough or foolish enough to start, to start first quarter of next year. And I, I'm in the foolish camp. So great opportunity to take advantage of there. I want to remind everybody, if you've got any questions for Ray, please, uh, make sure that you send them in to us. We'll, we're going to take some Q&A uh, at the end of this, um, af after we do uh, this interview and, and some further announcements. So please put your questions in here for Ray. Ray, can you tell us about the Overseas Private Investment Corporation? You were president and CEO uh, appointed by the president uh, to, do the, to do that job. It, it is a, you know, it's an important organization, but one that people don't know a lot about. What did it do and what did you accomplish there? Okay. Well, for the those of you who can remember your history books, it, it was the old Marshall Plan from World War II that was restarted at the end of the Vietnam War in the, in, in, uh, the 70s. And I managed a $30 billion kind of private investment for the US government in 180 countries around the world. And the idea behind it is going to countries where someone wants to put a business, and a lot of our listeners, I'm sure, are will be interested in this. And that don't have access to capital. They can't get a bank to go. And, and primarily they're countries that have a GDP per person of less than $8,000. And that's an incredible, that, that's the majority of the world. And mm -hmm. so if you want to do a cell phone project in Africa or, you know, a, a, a hydroelectric plant in, 
in Brazil and you can't get access to capital, that's what we're there for. While I was there, we restructured the whole thing. It's it's now has a new name. It's called the DFC Development Finance Corporation, and it's it was raised from 30 billion to 60 billion. But the primary focus under the Trump administration is what's called near sourcing, and you've heard of onshoring, near I'm sorry, near shoring, and near shoring is giving emphasis to the Northern Triangle, which is Gua, you know Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, those countries that have had the immigration issues because of the high joblessness and providing economic financing for someone to go down and build a factory or build a power plant in those countries. And so it was a very gratifying, I mean, I did, I think we had 800 projects and I traveled, you know, all over the world from wow. Kazakhstan to Vietnam to, you know, Botswana doing projects. So, but now I'm just back in Dallas. So I'm, I'm very excited to be back here. I spent a lot of time on airplanes back. Yeah. What a great experience. Yeah. A great experience. Um, uh, just a reminder, if everyone has any questions, please send them in to us. I'm just going to see if we can, uh, we have a few more moments before we hand it over for a quick break. Um, one of the things that the general manager from WFA said that recently, that if you asked him what he was surprised by during this time as his, in his tenure was that health and safety would become such a big part of his job, even prior to the pandemic, but, um, um, definitely now the level of concern that you have for health and safety of employees is probably not something that we were thinking about quite as much five or 10 years ago, for sure. Do you, do you, do you sense that in terms of the people that work for you and their health and safety being um, uh, really becoming a much bigger part of what you do? It is, but the government, you know, people don't realize that regulations, when someone comes to work and you want to take their temperature, I mean, or find out their medical history, there are privacy laws in this country. And a lot of things that as an employer, you would like to do and the other employees would like you to do, but you just can't do it because of government regulation. But, you know, the primary thing I think you're going to see is people's getting their temperatures taken before they come to work. How do you tell a patron that walks into the front door of your restaurant, hey, I'm going to take your temperature before you can sit down and have dinner. And so, I mean, there are going to be a lot of, you know, social changes that potentially come out of this. It's the handling of, of, of the food. It's, how long are people going to want to be served by someone in a mask and gloves? And so what do you but, think about that? I mean, have you have, so I've been at several restaurants now and um, you know, you do have, you do have a tendency to get used to stuff uh, over time. And, and um, do you feel like you're imposing on your, your, your customers? If your servers are, I mean, I know you'd like to see a smile and say hello and say, thank you, but some customers really want to feel comfortable and safe. So, I mean, do you feel like it's off putting? No, I, I, not right now. I think people are accepting of it. A few months from now, if some restaurants go to where half the waiters are wearing them or half not, then it, it gets a little uncomfortable, I think, for some people. And they, they might want to go to a place that doesn't have it. And other people want to go to places that do require it. But there are other things that are changing. Like at the Katie Trail Ice House, we no longer have menus. You, you get your coat, your coaster for your drink has like a barcode on top. You hit it with your phone and the menu comes up on your phone. So there are a lot of things that are getting touched. I think that's a permanent change. Yeah. As well as in Europe, when you go to the, your table, I mean, when you pay, you usually give your credit card at the table to your waiter and they pay right there. And the United States always take them, you know, for security is why they've been doing it in Europe. Well, now there's technology to where when you order by that barcode, it immediately your check and you have already given them your credit card. So when you're finished with your meal, you just walk away. You don't have to wait for a waiter to bring, bring your check and you've already built into the system beforehand the kind of tip you're going to leave and so does that turn tables faster and or do people like it better when there's a little bit more interaction with their waiter and not to where it's just all electronic i mean those are social norms that are going to be yeah interesting to watch. yeah well and some of these changes are probably here to stay i mean i i i personally have uh, had some of this check out recently at a couple of restaurants where i thought well that was really slick and you know, I didn't, nobody had to touch anything and nothing happened. It was really fast and they didn't have to come back to my table three times. So I figured there's probably, there's probably something there that'll stick around, I assume. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for your time. We're going to, um, we're going to make sure that we get some of those live uh, chat questions in and we're going to move back now to a quick break and hear from Platinum, our sponsor, our Platinum sponsor, excuse me, McCarthy. So let's go now and get a Quick word about McCarthy and again, send those questions in and we'll get them answered with Ray. Thank you, Ray. Well, thank you, Ray and David. Uh, 
we appreciate the opportunity to be a platinum sponsor today. And Ray, you know, your comments about being on the offensive, uh, we love that approach as a entrepreneurial organization such as McCarthy. Uh, we actively are engaging our personnel throughout the United States and especially here in Dallas to be proactive. As an essential business, we have been continued to stay engaged throughout this last 90 days. And it's changed our organization dramatically. But I will tell you that uh, we are actively growing because of this. And we have been very engaged across all of our markets. So I will tell you that we are hiring. And uh, it's a positive for us. As an employee-owned organization, this year we'll turn 156 years old. And we are stronger than ever. And with 16 offices and 25, 2,400 employees across the United States, uh, we stay committed and focused in the commercial markets that we serve. But because of our diversification into solar, into water, wastewater, industrial sectors, in addition to our commercial construction of healthcare and office buildings, aviation, and the arts, keeps us entrenched in the communities that we serve. What's really exciting is our organic growth has really allowed us to build our trade labor uh, within our ranks. And so right now we're over 400 individuals, craftsmen and women. And with this out robust outreach program, our focus is to really target our high schools and really engage uh, with alternative opportunities for our children to engage in the design and the construction community. And so we're passionate about continuing to engage our students and I'm pleased to say that we've hired over 40 new employees for McCarthy over the last uh, few months. And starting Monday, we have 32 summer interns joining our organization. So we just think that because of this, we're continuing to grow opportunities for both our students in the community, but also we embark on our program this summer uh, with our colleges to ensure that we look to continue to grow our ranks in the months and years to come. So we look for part of the momentum in the marketplace. And again, we're going to play that offense, uh, Ray, like you are as well. And uh, before I turn it back over to David, if you have any other questions for Mr. Washburn, please submit them in the chat function below. And again, thank you for the allowing us to be a sponsor in this incredible event. David, back to you. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, we have, do have some questions coming in here. Uh, this is um, consumer spending is the backbone of the US economy. What can Congress do to encourage consumers to start spending to spur the economy and, pro and promote a V-shaped recovery? You talked about possibly a J-shaped recovery. Can Congress stimulate for a V-shaped recovery? And what should they do? Well, that's more social norms, I think, than what Congress can do. P people just got to feel comfortable go out and spend money. I mean, it's and get out and doing it. What, what can Congress do right now? Well, is just encourage businesses to get back open again. Now, there are two sides of this coin. There's a health issue and there's the business issue. I'm, I'm speaking purely from the business side of the equation, not the health side. And you know, if we get open and the, the flywheel of democracy, of uh, capitalism gets going again, and my waiters at Mi Casino then go spend money at Royal Blue, and then the Royal Blue guy spends money at the Gap, we got to get the flywheel going again. So do you think, do you think uh, we need more economic stimulus or rescue from Congress at all? Look, we have what a, they put $3 trillion into our, into our GDP. You don't think that's going to be an inflationary thing. We've already seen brisket prices double in the last two weeks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Meat prices are shooting up. All our commodity things are going up. It's like people are, are going to wake up to this inflationary thing. Cause all this money, these, these $600, uh, bonus payments are given to uh, the unemployed, you know, they're going to go spend that money, which is great for the economy, but it's got to be spent. And our, the reason brisket prices and things are doubling up is because capacity is being shut down. It's not that right. the demand's gone up. And the airlines, look, look at American Airlines, they're cutting, you know, hundreds and hundreds of flights. They're going to get pricing power on the customers when it finally comes back and you want to take that trip. Instead of being 20 flights a day to New York, they're now five. Right. Who's got the pricing power? Well, do you have any optimism at all about spending? What is your feeling about consumer spending? I mean, you probably have some early gauge in terms of seeing that people are coming to, or are not coming to your restaurants. Well, they are. In fact, when I talk to the people that work for us, their savings is as high as it's ever been in their lives because they've had nothing to spend it on. And so 
when, when it opens up and they can go out and spend again, that's when this inflationary kick, in my view, is going to happen. And that's why this fall, you know, you asked earlier, what's a political thing going to look like? Well, you know, after Labor Day, are we going to get a huge spike in inflation because all of a sudden supply has been constrained so much? And everyone now wants to go out and buy more brisket. Does it quadruple in price? I, I don't know. So the brisket but, index. The brisket index or the avocado index. I mean, that's our, you know, we're a huge buyer of avocados. And as that gets shut down, it's like, I mean, you can't have a Mexican restaurant without a uh, guacamole, you know, but I can't charge $50 for a side of guacamole. So, right. you know, where, what happens? Uh, here's another question. Retailers headquartered in our market have really struggled. What lessons have we learned from those that have done well? that we can take into the future to ensure some ongoing success in our industries. Are they, have you that, seen any local success stories here from, from our locally headquartered I mean, companies? I, I look like in our shopping centers, the, 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 the locals, you know, just batting down the hatches and, and they're coming out of it fine. I mean, not fine, but they're, they're going to come out of the deal. The ones, I mean, even Marcus, what do they have $6 billion in debt and they wrote off $5 billion. Well, now you have a company that made, 280 million last year in profit and they had 400 million of uh, of debt service. Well, now they no longer have debt service. Well, look, we just woke up new marks, a profitable company. Mm -hmm. JC Penney have a business model that can sustain itself. Uh, probably not. Does Neiman's absolutely has a business model. You know, pier one's already determined. They had no business model going forward. Right. Tuesday morning took bankruptcy yesterday. You know, you read the stories on their business model. Is that a, what this is forced on, and I see it in the restaurant business, and I see it in my shopping centers too, is a lot of people that were on teetering on falling over, it just got accelerated from maybe a two or three year slow train wreck to a 60 day train wreck. And so I think we come out of this stronger at, at, at the end. There's going to be a lot of carnage and damage in between. But as long as people have controlled their debt, they think it'll come out fine. Do you see some segments in retail and restaurant hospitality space that, that do make you optimistic? Well, in the restaurant space, you go to any fast food restaurant. I went by Brahms on Lemon last night, sneaking out to get some ice cream, May 45, and they had a line all the way. Surprised the I didn't see you there. I, I love that place. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Chip is fantastic at that Brahms. Well, they had Rocky Road for me, but they had a, they, they had a line of at least 30 cars. So I thought, all right, I'll just park and go inside. People are waiting all the way outside in the parking lot. I mean, that's, that's at almost nine o'clock on a random Wednesday night. So the fast food is, is doing well. I think casual dining that the big, the capital grills of the world, the Del Frisco's that really rely on the convention travel business, or they call the mice business, the meetings, you know, type business convention and event business. That's going to be a difficult one to come back because a people's budgets are pinched and B those are totally are driven by the tourism uh, event business and that so, comes back last you think yeah, the tour uh, tourism you know, event business is last like albernays or bobs they're doing fine yeah you go further down to the capitol grill and i bet you know you and they're they're public businesses you can look at their numbers and they're they're in a mighty struggle and i think they will be for a long time I've got a sort of a real practical question what happens if a service employee is diagnosed with covid19 will the restaurant have to close for a period of time I assume you've worked on a lot of those procedures. What would happen? Yeah, fortunately, we haven't had that issue. But if it would happen, yeah, we'd have to close I, probably for a 24-hour period and disinfect the restaurant and retest all the employees. Come back. And how do you think how do you think customers would respond to knowing that that happened? I think they would respond to the way they think the restaurant responded. If they thought you disinfected everything, you tested all your employees to come back, and I think they'd be fine coming back. It's but if you just didn't close for some period of time, I think they would feel very suspicious of it. Sure. Uh, I have a question came in on text. Where does Ray see Dallas and North Texas in five years, both in major industries and on a global scale? So sort of looking beyond this, a longer term trend. Well, from a macro perspective, um, you look at cities, New York, Chicago, the ones we're recruiting companies from, they're gonna have to raise taxes. I think our Dallas City Council did the right thing yesterday and in not increasing property taxes by 8%. Um, they, were gonna, they had a vote yesterday and I think it was defeated 10 to two or something. But as long as we're viewed as a low regulation, you know, low corruption, low tax place, people are gonna pour in here. But California's personal income tax is 13.6%. They're gonna have to raise it to pay their, their debts. 
the same with Illinois with their pension and, and problems. And I think that's just, we're going to be a massive beneficiary from all that. Do you see and, an, a, a realignment or a further realignment in uh, the Texas as a draw coming out? You're sort of hinting at that, but is that, do you really see that this would create some fundamental shifts away from higher tax well, states? Okay. If you look at Chase, what they're doing up at Legacy Business Park, I think they've got 10 or 15,000 employees out there or they're building to that. So they're going to take people out of these dense office environments, I think in Manhattan and different areas and move them to a place that is spread out. People feel like they can drive themselves to work. I think the subways, I mean, I don't know the next time I'm going to feel safe getting on the subway, even wearing, wearing a mask. I mean, and so a lot of the people that have been commuting that way, all of a sudden that makes us, I think a lot more appealing uh, as a city, as a region. Does the, do you feel like uh, the convention industry business uh, like that, does that need additional support? Because that just seems like as the airlines go and as travel goes, the, having a large convention is going to be the last thing that people are going to want to be doing right now. And you've, you're talking about building a hotel over here across the street that's going to cater to that group. How long, what's the timeline on the recovery there? Do you feel like it's got to be longer? No, no, no. I, I think in two years that comes back. I think this year obviously is a wash year. Next year will probably be a wash year. And then if people get comfortable traveling again, it'll come back. Dallas, since you are the Dallas Regional Chamber, you know, it's important that our convention center gets strengthened because the competition regionally within the region for between Arlington and what they're building, they're about to build another 850 room convention hotel. Uh, Omni's going to add 450 rooms to their hotel in downtown Fort Worth. Tarrant County's building a brand new convention center. I mean, there's an arms race among the convention centers. And again, with DFW Airport, Love Field, our central location, I think we're going to be a big beneficiary out of this. And people might be a little more leery of going to a Las Vegas or a New York for convention. But, you know, the perception of us being so spread out here and a little more open, I think is a beneficiary for us. Can you speak a little bit more about the DRC um, and the business community as a whole? What should be some of the which should be the plan the focus for the future of business um or or changes in the future of business related to the kind of what we're going through right now well again it's it's the promotion of us as a place that someone can move to they can it's an entrepreneurial city there's a reason dallas has grown so large and the largest city in the state was for example san antonio up until Oh, probably the 1950s was bigger than Houston, Dallas, all of us, but it's a provincial town and Dallas mm -hmm. has an entrepreneurial spirit that if somebody comes in the town and, you know, if you look at, at the people from a Mark Cuban to a Kenny Trout to a Tom Hicks, all these people, Jerry Jones, none of them are from Dallas. They all came right. here, the city of Oz. And they came here because people would back someone with, with a great idea, who's honest, who's transparent, people want to welcome you in their office and back them in, in, in projects. And so, I mean, John, the president of, uh, of the chamber this year, I mean, he, he's a great example of the entrepreneurial spirit that Dallas has. And I think we just need to continue to, to build on that. And I, I can't tell you how important this low taxing environment is compared to these other places. You talked a moment ago about how you would respond to a COVID-19 incident, perhaps in a restaurant, someone saying, what's it going to take to get consumers comfortable with health and safety measures implemented by retailers to get them back to stores. So you you talked you talked about I think you're talking about transparency and honesty about what's going on. Is that really what it takes? Like, okay, I trust you guys are going to do the right thing and so I'm willing to come to you or is it is it more than that to get consumers comfortable to come out of their houses and start to spend more money? People want to spend money with people they trust. And even in pre-COVID, they would go to a restaurant because they trusted you were giving them a fair return on the dollar they were spending on their meal, right? You ordered a chicken, you wanted the best chicken breast they had and or a hamburger or a steak or whatever. And because you trusted the, the proprietor to provide you the best thing. So I think it's coming back to the same thing. It's like customers will go back to the retailers that they trust. And if, if you find out someone had a sick employee and they never closed, I don't see how they recover once that gets out there. And especially in today's social media, things get around so, so fast. The first restaurant to close down, it's well recorded, was neighborhood, I mean, the uh, town hearth over on Irving. He right. shut down two or three days into it. He still hadn't opened back up because, and he's got a great restaurant, great rep reputation, but he didn't want to chance that by being in a position of 
people not feeling like he responded to what um, they would expect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I want to ask you briefly this is a question I'm interested in. I'm working on a story right now about the food supply, which I think you'd be uh, a good person to talk to that you have these institutional food supply and you got consumers and the institutional one has just been totally messed, messed up. Um, and we've seen a spread now in the cost of what farmers are getting paid for beef and what uh, the consumers end up paying for beef and that's getting larger and larger. Um, we got the meat packing plants with challenges there and, and, um, and, and having those being hot spots for COVID-19. Are you concerned about uh, being someone who buys a lot of food, what this experience has shown us about um, insecu you know, weaknesses in our food supply system? I, I don't, the, the logistics of food supply in the United States is unmatched. It's, it's incredible how quickly you can get things around the country and get, it's more the producer side than the logistics side. So, you know, the meatpacking plants that have had all the problem, you know, people are suspicious of that. They, they're going to have to get that fixed, but that's, that's at the producer side. You're going to see restaurants go to, when you order something, it's going to get to where you're going to find out where that food came from. You're going to say, my tomato is from, you know, Bob's tomato farm over here and the lettuce is from there. It's going to get so transparent in really the near future. You're going to know where all your food ingredients were sourced from. And that's part of the trusting of the consumer is they're going to want to trust they're getting things. The interesting part right now is the farm to market, which has been a huge you know, hot button in the restaurant industry where people are buying from small truck farmers out, you know, close. It's like, can they ensure to their customer that that truck farmer, meaning a small farmer in a little town, are they really using non, you know, are they not really using a bad pesticide or has it been transported in a temperature controlled box? And all those kind of things, I think are going to take that part of the business and upset that a little bit. And people go down a Whereas if you go to a Cisco or the big food suppliers, they'll be able to ensure all the way back to the, mm -hmm. you know, the source. Do you, are consumers more, more interested in local? I hear you saying consumers are more interested in local food. Um, we have this kind of global food system. Mm -hmm. Does, does this moment say, Hey, if we kind of have these local food economies, we might be more resilient in the future to issues like this. Yeah. But when you go back to the local food, you're going to want to know how is that produced? You know, if you're a small little restaurant and buying from, some guy growing tomatoes in the backyard, you know, it's, but if you're a big operation like we are and we're buying, you know, thousands of pounds of tomatoes or things, I mean, it's, it's hard to support these little local farmers because they just can't produce enough. And Cisco or your big food suppliers that bring it in, you know, how do they source it? And they're, those are going to become more and more questions that people are, the consumer is going to ask. So I want to wrap it up and see if you, if you have a, if you can come up with sort of, excuse my French, Eric, sort of your oh shit moment when you were going, this was all sort of starting to happen. Uh, if you remember, like the NBA was can canceled the whole season, like on a Wednesday night. Did you have a moment where you where you realized that this was going to be deep and and, and damaging? Yeah, when when they shut all the restaurants down at, at you know over a weekend, I remember my family was going on spring break with our kids, and I. You know, I stayed here because I wasn't sure what the scene was going to look like that week. And then we just sat down with our team and, and we adjusted quickly, just like so many people, you know, listening in today. We, we just had to sit down and adjust and everyone stepped up. Um, and it was kind of a more of a slow moving train that week. Yeah. It wasn't like Mark Cuban where I was just flipped out on the side where they canceled at that second we could see it coming. We just didn't know the severity of it or how long it would last. But listen, everyone, everyone pitched in to see that it worked because we had to furlough 1800 people, you know, right out of the box. And our senior team that stayed, we said, stay in touch with your people. We're going to bring everyone back as quickly as we can. But when you take your revenue, again, we, we were doing 10% of our business from takeout. We had to adjust to 50%. And Cinco de Mayo was a meltdown for us because Everyone wants to eat between, when you do takeout normally, people pick up between 5.30 and nine o'clock. 10% of your overall sales. Now we're doing half our sales between six and 7.30. Right. So all the restaurants in town just got, I mean, we, we had to learn and adjust. And, and that, I think that if you said at a moment where it was like, uh-oh, what's happening now? It's more of like readjusting our, the way we do business. Yeah. 
the creativity has been exceptionally interesting in your space and in every space, the way people have responded. So I, uh, Ray, I want to thank you so much. It's been a really interesting, cool conversation. A pleasure to spend this time with you. Thank you. Okay, thanks. And I'm going to head it back to uh, Dale, President and CEO of the Dallas Regional Chamber for a few closing remarks. So thank you for having us. And um, thanks for all the great questions, everybody. David, thanks for doing such a great job of moderating. I thought you asked some great, thoughtful questions. Appreciate it. Ray, my good friend Ray Washburn, there's nobody better in this community who understands the intersection of restaurants and retail and real estate. Uh, loved your candor, Ray. Thank you very much for providing your thoughts on what's going on. Nobody loves Dallas more than Ray Washburn. I'll tell you that right now. He, is, he loves Dallas. His office is filled with Dallas art from, from, uh, from original uh, artists and so forth. But, um, but I, I, great, great to have Ray on during this time. Ray, I'm gonna give you one stat about the density. New York City has 29,000 people per square mile. Dallas has less than 4,000 per square mile. So there's the difference between New York and Dallas when you talk about people wanting to get out of that density, I think. Uh, John, thank you for your leadership. Thanks to JLL, Jody, thank you for sponsoring this. Thanks to McCarthy, Charlie Busher, what a great company McCarthy is. Thanks to our Board of Advisors members who, uh, who joined us today. Thanks for all you do for the Chamber and all you do in our community. And I just wanna mention one thing, we have a big event coming up June 17th. We have the Texas State Comptroller, Glenn Hager, who's gonna be our guest. Uh, he's got a big job and a tough job because sales tax revenues are down oil tax revenues are down. So it's gonna be a very, very challenging session in Austin this coming January as a result of that. And that's one you're probably not gonna to wanna to miss. Um, lots of resources on our website to deal with COVID-19 and, uh, and to uh, help your companies get back to the office. Uh, take a look at it, we'd appreciate it. So until next time, thanks again and really appreciate everybody and everybody's role in this. And uh, Ray, thank you, David, thank you guys. Thank you. Take care.